we've got a panel discussion coming up with John Hubbard acting as moderator, where we're going to be going through what cyber defenders need to know and do based on, well, recent events. Well, 2021, right? So, John, go ahead and take this over and uh, let's see it done. All right. Thank you, Justin. So uh, looking for my panelists video here. I don't know if I just don't have them on my screen or if they haven't popped in yet. There we go. I'm here. Hello, folks. <laughs> Hi. Good to have you back and good to have you now here, Ryan. So what we want to do in this uh, panel is we know after lunch or after whatever meal you may have just had, uh, people get that little after lunch kind of uh, slow down. So we want to have a lively discussion here and we want you, the audience, to be able to interact with us. So before we get started, I want to say hop on over in the Slack to the channel called Panel Threats Challenges 2021. And we will be trying to monitor that and best address whatever we can hear uh, and, and see kind of along the way uh, as we go through a very short but hopefully awesome panel for you. Uh, real quick to start off here, um, I know that some of us have already done intros, so I, I don't know if everyone watching now has seen those original talks or intros. So let's go through real quick, uh, starting with Grace, then Ismail, then Ryan. Um, just real quick, who you are, and then also as relevant to this panel, like what is your particular topic of experience and the type of attacks you deal with or see on a day-to-day -day basis? Sure. Uh, so hi, everyone. My name is Grace Picking. I'm a senior program manager within the Azure Active Directory product group here at Microsoft. So I specialize in working with our customers to make sure that they can get the most out of Azure AD and our hybrid components, um, as well as taking feedback on the product directly back to our developers and engineering managers to make the product better and scale to everybody. In terms of my area of expertise, it's identity. <laughs> so anything authentication, authorization based attacks. Uh, before I joined Microsoft or before I had this role, I was a Office 365 and SharePoint engineer. So I've got that background as well. Before that, I've been in release management and done a couple of uh, odd jobs here and there. But yeah, that's my area of expertise is all things identity. Fantastic. Ismail, what about you? I'm a senior sense uh, instructor and um... Uh, my well, an author, co-author of Five Thirty as well. I've been. Um, I guess I, I can define myself as a generalist. I, I've I've done pretty much everything on the on the red side, on the blue side. But on my day job for the last few years, um, I'm a senior principal engineer at McAfee Enterprise, and uh, I've been focusing on security operations, on you know applying what I have learned over the years, also doing incident response and malware analysis to uh, day to day operations. So. Uh, uh, this day, I lead a, a team that does, uh, that does uh, research, uh, so threat research, and productizes that in the form of uh, active act and passive countermeasures, as I showed uh, earlier today. Fantastic. And Ryan, welcome. Hey, how's it going? Good to see you again. Hey, folks. My name is Ryan, and I work as an incident response consultant for BlackBerry Security Services. So we basically respond to clients who get hit with uh, the whoopsies. <laughs> So I do a lot of ransomware cases because that's just kind of the, the, the in thing right now. And I'm also currently authoring uh, the new SANS course regarding ransomware. It's Forensics 528, 528 uh, Ransomware for Incident Responders. And so just in, embroiled in, in just my whole life for I don't know how long now has been ransomware every day. And so I'm here to, to speak on that behalf. Fantastic. So thank you all. Um, let's start there because we've already heard a little bit from, from Ismail and Grace, but Ryan, let's, uh, let's poke at your specialty first. Ransomware, I know, is something that's on literally every company's mind, every person's mind on a blue team. Um, ransomware has been around and really picked up probably a lot around 2013, 2014 area with CryptoLocker and all that kind of stuff. But how have you seen it change over the years as our architecture and our identity systems and all of that have started to move in these new directions? And what are some of the, the attacks you're seeing that are like fairly new as of recent and what kind of effects are those having? So this is always a funny, funny thing for me to respond to because when it really comes down to it, ransomware is like silly business. It's, it's such like, Oh, RDP was open and we popped in. We just, you know, copied Mimi cats over to the host and then we just double clicked it. And it's like, it's so commonly just ridiculous. You know, Cobalt Strike is in like, I don't know, 70% or so. I just made that number up. But of the cases that we see, it's so ridiculously common. The new stuff, people are like, what are the new things we're seeing? It's like, well, um, Hanseter came back. You're like, Hanseter? 
You mean like that old stupid info stealing banking Trojan? Like, yeah, the intrusion access brokers are using that now. Um, so we're seeing that more. And you're like, well, that's, that's old. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and then we're like, oh, yeah, exactly. System BC is being used more now for uh, post exploitation, you know, tooling and uh, lateral movement and C2 and things like that. It's like, well, what about like new, you know, like crazy new attacks or new technologies in that regard? I'm like, no, <laughs> we really don't see that a lot with ransomware cases. We, uh, we, I'm working right now with Red Siege. They're helping build out the range for the new course. And it, just sitting with them and telling them, here's the scenario. Here's the next scenario. Here's what we're going to do to be these ransomware threat actors. They're like, why would they do that? That's stupid. I'm like, I know. <laughs> They're like, well, that's not stealth at all. I'm like, I know. So a lot of what's new, there's really not a lot that's new. Since 2013 and 14, we have, of course, ransomware as a service, but that is now being joined up and merged, if you will, with uh, this ecosystem with malware as a service. So when we used to see Hanseter and Emotet for years and Iced ID and Azor World and, and all the other QBot and all the above, right? When we used to see those, it was like, ah, whatever. They have a, the you know, remote access to that system. We'll rotate that user's credentials and they move on with life. Well, now those are being sold at scale. And they're then dropping secondary and even tertiary uh, stages. And so we see a lot of things like, you know, if you can just go to the deeperreport.com and they have great write-ups on Conti and Ryuk and all the, uh, some of the bigger groups, we just see the old standard stuff. We see Hanser being brought in via weaponized Word document. Um, oh, it was not until today where I finally saw something that was more of an exploit in the office Maldoc space versus just, you know, macros that run uh, VBA stomping. People were seeing VBA stomping in some of the campaigns. That's cool. For the phishing, we're seeing some changes where in order to get the ICE IDs or, or whatever into the environment, they're doing things like sending ISO files into the environment because an ISO file, yeah, you don't see the mark of the web in there. So like smart screen doesn't really see what's in there. Um, we're seeing zip files that are coming in that are being double clicked by users and then have JavaScript files in there, which run natively. You know, Windows invokes the Windows scripting host and WScript says, okay, and then it runs, you know, just like I'm compatible with JScript, so let's just do it. So we're seeing some different ways for like the phishing, but really the tooling that most of them are using, it hasn't, it hasn't been changing very much at all. Um, and I'll, I'll digress here because I can go on for days, but the, the recent Conti leak, sorry, I was just going to make it with the Ryan show. <laughs> no, it's like, awesome. Oh, yeah. I should shut up for a second. Um, the recent Conti leak, you know, they're like, they gave all these crazy commands and people are like, this is crazy. They, they leaked their playbook. Go read the playbook. Look at what they leaked. That's what they teach their affiliates to do. They're like, use, uh, use NL test, uh, dump LSAS uh, with like task manager. Like it's, it's all easy stuff. So what we're seeing more of now is just more people being involved with it. And we're seeing a, a wider impact to the environment. And that's why it's on so many people's minds. Yeah, so I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, as you said, right, it's not really that maybe they're using better or newer tools. We're just kind of failing to stop it. But we are getting better tools, right? We heard a bunch of awesome stuff from Grace this morning. We saw it from Ismail. Zero trust is a thing that's further and further creeping in. So to our other two panelists, um, let's start with Grace. How is it, uh, what kind of stuff do you have in your area of um, expertise that may help address ransomware or any of these kind of threats really in any way that people may be underutilizing or otherwise? Um, do you have any uh, particular favorite features or anything that can help get in this problem's way? Yeah, so I think for me, it's, it's all about the basics, like logs. So you're signing logs, you're auditing logs, like having a look at what your users are doing that's like not normal, <laughs> not normal for them, not normal for your company. It's all well and good throwing all of these machine learning algorithms that either, you know, we at Microsoft make and security graphs and other third party providers. But that's based on, you know, intelligence as well as the overall threat landscape for you and your organization need to do that by you know, monitoring your logs, having a look at what your users or your service principles or your service accounts that are knocking around are doing, what scripts are actually running. Yeah, all these things that seem really basic, um, you know, that's really what you have to do is be monitoring so that you can, you know, detect it to start with, figure out what they're doing and to then be able to stop it or remove permissions for whatever it is that's going on. 
Are there particular features or things that you can turn on that you can say like, this is the specific thing that you should use as a data source that will tell you when someone's account is doing something it shouldn't be doing? I know Microsoft has some of those things, but I guess <laughs> the question is for the audience out there, um, like where might they start with that with some of your built-in features? So within Azure AD, we've got a large amount of, we do, we capture interactive and non-interactive sign-ins. Uh, and we also have audit logging in Azure AD and across M365. So the first thing is you should be putting them in your scene tool, whether that is Microsoft or not. They need to be going somewhere and they need to be being monitored. Um, and then within Azure AD, we have things like user sign in risk, which is based on our security graphs, which can you know, associate a user or a specific sign in with a risk level. And then you can apply conditional access policies based on that to do things like uh, require password reset. Um, you know, if it's impossible travel time or you know, a new device, for example, you can actually apply policies based on those things in uh, real time or uh, from the offline signals for user risk. So those are some of the things that uh, people can turn on and be looking at. Very cool. Ismail, um, from your perspective and, and maybe the zero trust kind of realm and, and also kind of dovetailing into a question I just saw in the chat room, um, what are some of the zero trust kind of centric technologies that you think would be best positioned to get in the way of some of these ransomware attacks? And I guess maybe tied into this because you mentioned you're in threat research. Um, we had a question about why is it that healthcare seems to be so susceptible to ransomware attacks in particular? Uh, is it that they're more interested in healthcare or is it that their defense isn't as good or anything that you could say on that as well? I was hoping that you would ask me that one because I've spent quite some, you know, quite a few years in, in the healthcare industry awesome. um, and, and defending and building, you know, SOCs uh, in, 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 for critical infrastructure here in the U.S. as well. So. Uh, let me start with the, because there's a few questions in there, the zero trust one, what can help? I'm going to go back to um, something that we have mentioned before, which is the detection, right? Uh, we, we tend to think that we need to, um, you know, do something like very advanced. As Ryan was mentioning before, uh, you would be like super, a lot of people here would be really surprised to see how simple these, these kits are, right? And these, um, uh, these, these, these attacks are, and they're always using uh, most of the times the same tools over and over again. Uh, in my position right now, and I've been doing instant response for many years, you know, where I had to be uh, boots on the ground, like doing all these things. Now in my position, I have the ability to actually see a lot of the telemetry that comes through our tools and see these attacks, like almost like life, <laughs> but in, in these uh, environments. And you would be surprised because sometimes they have the tools, they have the technology that may have been telling them with days and sometimes weeks in advance, hey, there is something you should be looking at, right? So, and I, I can talk about a case that's been very notorious, very public, right? I'm not gonna mention the name, but uh, you may or not have seen some logs related to that today. And, and these, for this ransomware attack that was you know, on the news, some of these organizations have had alerts for quite some time. Now, whether they acted on those or not, you know, whether the response was effective or not, that's a whole different story, which tells us that sometimes it's not about the product, it's not about the, 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 you know, the, um, uh, the technology. Sometimes you may have the technology, it may be that you don't have the right processes or the right people to, to respond to that. And this is something we cannot forget, right? Uh, I think I mentioned it in my, in my keynote, this is not a technology problem, it's a business problem, it's a people's problem. So uh, gangs like that, and you know, I mentioned DarkSide before, uh, what do they do? They go against critical infrastructure, could be hospitals, right, healthcare, and they're gonna be doing this in the middle of a uh, Friday night, right? I see most of these attacks happening at 4, 5 a.m. our time on the Eastern coast, right? And you can do the correlation, the math with uh, different time zones in Eastern Europe. You'll see the, how they work. <laughs> and uh, it, because it's a day job for them, right? 9, 10 a.m., they just go to work and they just do whatever they have to do. And that's it. Uh, they're going to do these before a, a you know, holiday, especially here in the U.S. So we need to start thinking about the problem holistically and, and not just about, about the tools. Things that I think can help. Uh, we talked about anomalous detection, right? Grace was talking about, about that. One of the biggest problems we have as a blue team today is the vast amount of data we have to parse. And we talked about Jupyter Notebooks, right? I'm a big fan of that, but even that doesn't scale, right? It's, it's for you to do some exploration on your own system. And 
but at large scale, you need to parse like, you know, huge volumes of data. And sometimes, you know, open source solutions doesn't cut it. Uh, so it might be a good time for us also to become familiar with what cloud-based technologies are out there that can help us to, to mine the data, reduce the data. Uh, we had a, a really good talk um, this morning from Securonix on how you can uh, um, you know, reduce the volume of data to something that is manageable to find a signal in the noise. And then uh, the key is going to be over the next few years, how do we automate uh, to a certain degree the tuning, the adjusting, the improvement of our uh, uh, rule sets, some machine learning models, and everything you know that we use to to catch the attackers. On the healthcare uh, note, I, I think healthcare. The problem is, it's a lot of legacy, right? A lot of lot of legacy uh, um, uh, solutions. The culture, it's very, um, let's say, control averse in the sense that when you apply a control and the control doesn't work, you have a false positive, for example, think about an IPS, right? Blocking something or a WAF or, or a firewall, next gen firewall, you're creating a denial of service condition, which, you know, to a doctor, anybody that is working in a, uh, in a hospital facility, that could, you know, mean like not being able to save a life, not being able to access the data that you need for, to, to attend somebody. So the culture is like very open, right? We need to have access to data right away. So that makes it very difficult to put controls as close to the data as possible as zero trust mandates, for example. So it's, um, it's a challenge. And um, you know, I have seen some teams doing a, a good job at, at managing that. Again, when you cannot prevent everything, you have to rely on doing faster detection and faster response, because that's, that should be the goal at the end of the day, not to block everything, but you know, to detect and react as soon as possible. Um, yeah. Yeah, the, the uh, minimization of of large impact, I think, is a way that I've I've seen it phrased a lot, right? Because we know that there's something that's going to happen. Um, speaking of large impact like that, I have seen some stuff, and I don't know if this falls squarely under, um, you know, the kind of stuff you've worked with or not, Grace. But uh, I've seen some of the documentation from Microsoft mentioning, like, look, when you move to a cloud-based, you know, Azure AD implemented kind of identity provider, even if you have some of these kind of attacks you're not necessarily left completely in the dark with infrastructure that's been destroyed, right? Um, is there anything that, that you've worked on in that respect where you've seen a company that's like been hit with something like this, but you're like, but we're good because we got Azure AD, right? At least we have the ability to log in. And, and is, are those technologies mitigating some of these really, really damaging effects that maybe we saw in the past? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so there have been a couple of very large public incidents where people's DCs or on-prem is just, just down, off, it's gone. You might as well have to completely rebuild. You know, it's like somebody pulled the plug. Um, and actually there was a case where a customer had, um, with authentication flows in Azure AD, you can have something called password hash synchronization, which is where you don't use ADFS or federation through another IDP. We, um, we sync the hashes of the hashes of the passwords on-prem to Azure AD and you can authenticate directly in Azure AD without the need to go back on-prem. Now, um, customers have two options with this. They can do the initial sync so that those hashes of the hashes are synced to Azure AD. And then the second switch is to then use that for authentication. Now, in the event where some of these large customers have been impacted, they've been able to very quickly switch to password hash synchronization for their users so they can still authenticate to Azure AD for those applications that are SaaS or integrated with Azure AD line of business that may be in the cloud that are unaffected by the original instant. So that has been the saving grace where I think it was, I can't tell you who, but I think it's within, you know, an hour we managed to get an organization after a very large attack uh, up and running and they could get back into Office 365, for example, because they had synced the initial hashes of the hashes and they could just go to, you know, portal.office.com and authenticate. That's that's super awesome. And one of those ways where it's like, I'm definitely about to call on you in a sec. Uh, yeah, one of the things that, that I, you know, when it comes to like, what's the disaster scenario, right? Ransomware being one of those disaster scenarios are kind of orbiting here. If you can make a solid case for like, if ransomware hits here and if it did, it would otherwise take everything else down, let's put in this control and it won't happen like that. Like that's a very tangible, easy thing to fix. Uh, Ryan. Over to you. And um, 
along with whatever it is, I, I know you, I'm sure you're going to jump in with something awesome. I was also going to ask, are there any key mistakes you see people make that allows something to go from like one machine compromise to like, oops, now the entire company is wiped out? Oh, goodness. Yes. And it actually, it falls right into uh, Grace's backyard, actually. So to comment on some of the things, uh, UBA, you know, you were talking about the machine learning algorithms to identify what's going on with these various accounts. User behavior analytics, whatever methodology you have, um, and especially just like you were talking about, I used to call it the uh, uh, land speed violation, you know, with the accounts logging in too soon, and even just GOIP based stuff. And Microsoft makes it pretty darn easy to deal with all your access policies. And you'd be like, no, we're not going to have business coming in from there. I don't want to, I don't want to allow that from there simply. Um, and then we were talking about healthcare, and, you know, I see a lot of healthcare being hit. And when we see healthcare, healthcare, we think we see the very large organizations with like multiple campuses, they typically have more funds, they typically allocate more money from their IT budget to security. And then these smaller places, it's still like a decent sized hospital, they just don't have the personnel, they can't pay the personnel enough, they're not familiar enough with security, they're too busy trying to run the infrastructure itself, which has a heavy burden on them. And we're just seeing them being overrun and overwhelmed by, and then these easy attacks come in and, and everything's all bad, right? Um, so the, the Azure AD thing, oh, I love it. Our clients, the number one thing that, that like just boggles their mind, like they're not thinking of it. They come to us, they come to another consulting agency, you know, whoever it is, whatever firm, say, hey, we got hit, we need to get back up, like now, I mean, up, 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 up. How do we fix this? And we're like, well, Okay, we get to find out what happened. So we're going to give you some scripts. You're going to deploy those throughout your environment. But AD is down. <laughs> so maybe you're not going to do that. So the quicker you can get Active Directory back up, that is one of the key freaking things in dealing with many of these ransomware cases. The more that Microsoft provides and other agencies provides the ability, you know, Azure AD, to just bring that right back up, that is phenomenal. You know, we have many of our clients who are like, do we, uh, do we try to buy the decryption key and, and decrypt these DCs? Like, no, you build new DCs, just resynchronize them. Don't try to decrypt that thing. That's not going to work. So having the ease, uh, having a, an easier method to do that, that is, that's where, it, that's, where it, that's where it is. So it's hard for deployment of scripting applications. You know, how are you going to recover accounts and policies and things of like that if the primary mechanism you use to weave throughout all of that is not available? Like, good luck. All right, anyway, uh, lateral movement, key mistakes, also um, grace with identity um, things in general. So we see threat actors get into an environment and then they're able to dump hashes, they're able to dump um, you know, something as simple as LSAS or whatever, but they're also able to you know, uh, like hash dump and cobalt strike and all these things, they're successful and they work and they're able to write into process memory if they're an admin on the machine, they can process inject into a process running under another user context. But of course there are no like overly privileged users running processes on general machines, right? <laughs> that's, the, that's one of the most common mistakes is you have these freaking DA accounts all over the place instead of like a proper service account. A damn thing's running like multiple scheduled tasks. It's running like, like three services are running under a DA account. Cool story. As soon as the threat actor gets into that environment and when they're able to grab that information, they toss a Kerberos out there and all of a sudden there's some spin attached to some super overprivileged account or like a freaking DA or an EA account, you know, whatever. And then all of a sudden they've got the keys to the kingdom, literally. And so that's why those attacks are so successful because, you know, zero trust, awesome. I would love to see a world where we have zero trust. My problem is that we have so the opposite right now. So the opposite. We have these crazy accounts that are just being, oh, you run this process and we'll run that under you. We're going to map this share technically under a DA account. That's fine. Like, no. And those are huge, huge mistakes that get made. And then that enables the threat actors to then just move wherever the heck they want within the environment. For, for really anyone on the panel, um... Given that that seems to be one of the critical mistakes that gets made, uh, what type of tools, processes, anything is out there that's an easy, quick win uh, that you've seen that's like scanning the environment for overprivileged accounts or like making those mappings? I know there's tools like Bloodhound and stuff like that. Is there anything similar that you've seen in terms of endpoints or otherwise um, that you can do to find these critical errors before someone else does? We talk about pink castle right in the uh in the talk so if you haven't used that that one that's that's one that we recommend that you you know check out um 
in terms of processes like purple team and exercises, it's a great way of, uh, you know, uh, seeing what could happen before you have the attacker on your, on your network. And, you know, a, a lot of times it's uh, what I see, it's, it's politics, right? So sometimes the, the SOC doesn't have the authority to change things uh, in, in IT, right? It's a different team. Like Ryan is, is, is smiling. You probably have, you know, gone through that when doing instant response all the time. And especially the larger the company is, the more complicated it gets to, to apply these controls and to change things. And usually these things don't happen until you have a big incident. So that's why I say purple team and exercises, if you can get some, you know, even if you can start small, but you get some, uh, you get to demonstrate some value coming out of that. Uh, eventually you can get to maybe a more like an emulation of a threat actor or something like that. That's going to, to, to showcase what can, what can go wrong and then give you the ability to implement uh, additional tools for that. What about, um, for th so I see Justin in the, in the chat room here talking about dynamic access control and other things. Uh, Barry Anderson asks, you know, vendor says, well, my product needs to be domain admin to be able to run. Um, I'm mm -hmm. sure we've all heard that one before, and maybe sometimes it might maybe be true, but I think probably a lot of the times it's not. But if you're being told this, um, what is a response we can give to those vendors to say like, are you sure? How about we don't do this? You know, what's the, what's the pushback there? So from my perspective, I cover this all the time. In fact, this morning I was running a configuration assessment for an entire hybrid deployment for a customer. And I was literally just like pulling out all of these apps, for example, that have just been consented with like directory read, write all. I was like, what are these apps? They're like, very good question. I was like, no, that's not the answer I was hoping for. Um, but in terms of pushing back on, you know, these ISVs is you do need to keep pushing back and, you know, ask them, okay, exactly why is that? Have you looked at the other level of access that we could, could we, you know, does it need to actually be a account? Can it be a service principle, a managed identity? How can we, you know, protect that account if it has to be an account? Can we do just-in-time elevation of privileges? Can we lock it down even further, you know, looking at SOAR, at poor devices, all this kind of thing. But you need to challenge the ISV or whoever it is, a, it's a product vendor, it's a consultant. And in fact, it was funny in the... Um, when I was presenting earlier, someone said, oh, how do you approach ISVs that say they won't support Modern North? And I said, oh, challenge the ISV. And the person said, I'm sorry, I can't remember your name. Actually, it was Microsoft, <laughs> a consultant from Microsoft who's running PowerShell scripts. And I was like, oh, well, you should challenge. I was like, you're empowered to challenge us. I would love for you to challenge us on these things, you know, whether it is the permission they need for a PowerShell script or, a, you know, the most common one I see is like SharePoint migration tools which were put into the environment like a million years ago to do a migration from on-prem to the cloud. Pro project ended five years ago, it's still got GA, domain admin, SharePoint site collection owner for all of these. And it's like, yeah, at that time to perform that, it may have needed that, but you need to remove it afterwards. You need to be monitoring and keep challenging them. Is there anything that can be done endpoint wise uh, or any recommendations in yeah. terms of how people log in and, and any kind of features or otherwise that should be enabled on actual desktops and, and I guess servers really anywhere, right? That's less like cloud Azure AD centric and more on the actual user's device. I was going to say, John, that uh, I'm a big fan of uh, process monitoring, right? So pitching a uh, Microsoft system internals tool uh, to get to tell the, the the vendor, it's like, no, this is why you don't need to to run this as uh, you know an admin, uh, because what you need is just to get like read permissions to this registry key or this particular directory. So hey, see, I I can, <laughs> I know your product variant than you do. You know, that's that's not something we need to do here. Uh, and it's very simple, right? All you have to do is just run that that program, that install, or whatever you're doing, uh, uh, you know, next to uh, process monitoring and just figuring out what the program is trying to do. So just a quick a quick tip there. <laughs> I love that. You're going to run into, and this happens all the time, you run into the the sales engineers and the sales folks are like, well, well, that's what engineering says it has to happen. And you're like, well, no, it's not. And then they get caught in the middle and then you're like, can I just talk to them? And then and they're like, well, we'll put it on the roadmap. We're like, well, then I'm not going to install. Like, <laughs> get, get out of here. That's awesome. The other thing, I, you were asking about technologies that can deal with a lot of these things. Another thing that is just like, what are we doing here in, in this uh, IT uh, landscape? Like, come on. Microsoft has made freaking exploit guard and protected user groups and things that have been around for how many years now? 
like, oh, our domain forest level is 2012 or 2008 or whatever, right? Oh, we can't do that. Okay, um, see the problem? <laughs> like, you see the problem there? They're like, whoa, we can't update. Oh, okay, uh, sucks for you. So exploit guard, like, can you really not update? Exploit guard itself and the protected users groups when it comes to uh, like Mimi cats and just standard password dumping and, and access uh, reads and writes. It's like, come on. These are very, in all my reports, just about all my reports, it's like, Enable exploit guard, enable credential guard. Then you guys go through tuning, of course. I know it's not like it was the old Emmet, remember <laughs> the old Emmet. But so many people don't have these things enabled, and they're they're already there. They're already for the taking. And a lot of that is also so many uh, server 2012 R2s that we're still seeing that you know don't necessarily allow that. Uh, but not just using accounts that are uh, minimal in their 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 scope, right? And what they really need permission wise, but also containing the ones that we're actually using. And also why do we have a user who is an IT admin, like an IT administrator, right? That's um, his or her role, but then they have an account and that account is uh, either DA or, or still has crazy permissions. Why do they not have an account that they should uh, unlock or enable when they need to enable it and then use that? Why aren't they using identity management? Like something, I, I'm just, I like, um, uh, wait for it, wait for it, cyber arc, cyber arc. <laughs> so it's two words together. So I, I, I like use cyber arc for years. That type of, uh, of methodology, I have to have a token. I have to have a password. I go check out that credential. I can use that privileged credential. I then reset the damn thing. It's also in the protected users group. And then, hey, a threat actor is not going to come in and go, I want that one and then take it. The technology is there. We just, don't see it widely implemented. Yeah, we've got a bunch of links flying in the chat room. So this is going to be one where, especially Mark, he's been posting just tons and tons of related stuff along the way. Grace, it looked like you had something to uh, to throw in there as well. Um, back to you. Yeah, so I think it does come back to the like the basics, the fundamentals. Like these attackers to start with aren't going to use all of the big guns in their arsenal if they can just get in with your password without MFA. Whether that is using Mod North or or not, if you're not then using the stuff for Modern North like MFA uh, or trying to get rid of passwords completely by using things like Windows Hello for Business, Authenticator apps, FIDO2 tokens, you know, that kind of thing, then, you know, you all of the stuff is kind of, you know, secondary. You need to do the basics, you know, make sure that you're even if you turn these things on report only, like Ryan was saying, there's so many things you can just turn on. And somebody in the chat was asking about MCAS. It's the same with MCAS in terms of turning it on in like report only mode. And you're just having a look at all of this shadow IT that you didn't even know was under your nose, where somebody's probably reusing their corporate username and password to create an account for that's not MFA, that probably within days is in some export somewhere on the dark web right um it's things like that that you really need to be doing and locking down to pause and saw devices with device-based conditional access all of the things you can do from modern north that's going to help you massively um in terms of just doing some of the basics to secure those accounts or ultimately remove passwords or remove where it doesn't need to be account it could be a service principal managed identity that kind of thing yeah fantastic um we have about two minutes left here, so let's do a quick lightning round around the horn here. We'll start with uh, start with Ryan. If there was one piece of advice that you can give to people right now to go back to work immediately after the summit and check or run or do or whatever it is, what would that thing be uh, for them? Grace picked this up uh, or mentioned it earlier, and it's check your visibility. Uh, look to see what your visibility is. And you need to be able to identify things like if there's Kerberos in the environment, are you grabbing those event ID codes? They're not hard to find. Google Kerberos event ID. Like you'll, you'll see the two primary ones to use. Um, are, do you have your logs going to an aggregator? If you don't, or even if you do, what do you have the default log rotation size on your hosts? Um, that could suck too. So the more visibility you have, the better. Um, and the easiest way that I, I try to put it is if you look at some, if you try to do some of the MITRE mapping, you can't have a blue team talk without mentioning MITRE at some random point. If you try to do all that, and it's like, these are the detection methods. Can you do that in your environment? Do you have Sysmon installed? Gosh, I love Sysmon. It's such a, such a freaking game changer. Um, you don't have to have multi-million dollar EDRs and stuff. I mean, yeah, they help, of course. 
But, you know, just what are you able to see? Can you see when a process runs? Can you see the command line? Can you see who ran it? Can you see what users are logging in? And how far back can you see that? Just your visibility, mapping that out. Uh, very, very important. Uh, check out Mauer Archaeology's logging cheat sheets for more on what to actually log. I, I love his work. So I just, I like to push that out. Awesome. Ismail, what about you? I'm going to say one, one thing, cyberlistics. So go back to the office and dedicate the next uh, 30 days to identify how Cobalt Strike behaves, right? I don't know, it's a, it's a red teaming tool, so there's no one behavior, right? But Cobalt Strike does certain things in a very specific way. Like if you get really good at detecting privilege escalation with name pipes or, you know, similar artifacts are created by Cobalt Strike, you're going to be catching 80% of the stuff that you see, uh, that we see on a daily basis. Okay, so quick and dirty, just get good at that. First 30 days, identify how it behaves, uh, you know, write some detections, Sigma rules, Omega. We're going to talk about threat sightings tomorrow. Um, share that with the community, right? Share what you find. There are some good articles on that. And, you know, the next 30 days, focus on detecting that, threat hunting, right? See what you're missing and then put all of that into, into production. So you have a 90-day plan right there. Awesome. Fantastic. And the final word to Grace. You know, it's funny because I'd like to think at this point in time, kind of after the, well, not after, we're not post pandemic, but given that this is hybrid working, I would love to not say this, but I have to. Multi factor authentication, <laughs> please, please, please. <laughs> Whether it's you as just an end user, if you're not empowered to do it as an admin yet, just put it on your accounts. And I'm not just talking about corporate accounts, I'm talking about everything your Instagram, your Facebook, whatever you can do, put MFA on. And then for enterprises, disable legacy authentication. With Azure AD, you can monitor uh, with the logs or with report only what is actually using basic or legacy authentication protocols and move them over to, as we said before, SAML, OIDC, OAuth2, whatever's right. Um, and then you can disable it through conditional access in Azure AD, but you also need to disable it at the source. So Exchange, for example, turn it off there so that you've got both things. And then, yeah, please make sure your logs are going somewhere. <laughs> and that they're being looked at because that will give you all of the information in terms of interactive, non-interactive sign-ins and audits in terms of the logging of those users and their authentication authorization activity to you know, see what's really going on. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone to, uh, to everyone on the panel here. Awesome advice, tons of stuff. Tried to cram in as much as we could in 35 minutes here. I think we did a decent job and also got a whole bunch of stuff in the chat room. So everyone go click all of those links and then bookmark every single one of them. Uh, read through that and you will get some hopefully fantastic prioritized tips for getting some of this stuff in place.